Here's another one of those problems that you will need to check with your local building department on. And I do have building code information on sloping walkways at our website in the stair building code area. However, the information in this video is not going to be applying to a situation like this. It's going to be applying to a situation like this, where you have a steeper walkway and a set of stairs that might not be able to be modified. And I don't think your local building department is going to like this setup here because of this area right here, where the sidewalk is actually actually going to be encroaching into the step. So we're actually going to have a smaller width here. But it might not be a problem if the width of the stairway meets the minimum dimensions for your local area. And I don't think a situation like this is going to work because we're going to be creating a trip hazard. And I don't really think a situation like this is going to work that good either because it could also create a trip hazard. I think all we're going to be left with will be to do something like this and deal with the extremely high riser on this end. And this situation right here isn't going to matter what size risers you have for the rest of the stairway. So for example here we have 7 inch risers. Over here we have 5 inch risers. And the dimension is still the same right here, 9.5 inches. And we're going to have the same situation if I had 9 inch risers. And most of the time residential stairways will have a maximum riser height of 7 and 3 quarter inches. But older building codes will allow for 8 inches. So again you would need to check with your building department for that information. And another suggestion might be to create some type of a landing with a step in the walkway. However this could be a problem because you're usually going to have a curb on this side and a street over here and possibly creating a trip hazard in this area right here. Now keep in mind that these are only suggestions. You will need to check with your local building department to see if they have a better idea. Here is another one of those tips I'm just throwing out there. I'm not about to suggest you need to do it if you can get the lumber at a reasonable price. However, as the price of lumber increases, we might need to start considering other options, and this just might be one of them. So let's go ahead and take a look at a couple of our options here. And the first one will be using a solid piece of lumber. The next one would be using a 2x10 and a 2x6 ripped in half. The next will be a 2x8 and a 2x4 and then we're going to have two 2x6s in our last example. You can use a variety of different combinations if it will work for your project. And keep in mind that I don't know if this would be something approved by your local building department or local structural engineers. However, I can tell you that I have seen this done with good results plenty of times and in a variety of different countries. However, in the United States, I don't seem to see it too often. And I think the main reason for that is that larger lumber is readily available almost in every part of the United States. That is not always going to be the case in other countries. Well, let's go ahead and zoom in on our solid piece of lumber. This can be a 2x12 or a 2x14 larger lumber. This one here is going to provide you with the widest out of our example. This one here will provide us with the same width, I believe, as this one here, 11 inches. And if you are going to use this method, you're going to lay out the stringer from the front. So I just went ahead and moved these stair stringers back a little bit to provide you with an example of that. You're not going to be lining up a template with the back. You're going to be lining it up with the front. So let's go ahead and zoom out here, give you a better idea of what we're talking about. As all four of the examples have the stair stringers lining up with the front of the lumber. And of course what they would look like after we remove it. So we've laid out our stair stringers and have the largest one out of the group here. And then basically two with the same size over here. So let's go ahead and fix everything up. This is what it would look like after you laid it out, not the example that I showed you previously. And if I was going to use the two pieces of lumber, I would firmly attach them together, maybe grab a scrap piece of lumber, and attach the two pieces together at both ends to make sure that they're not going to be moving while you're laying everything out. And of course the separate piece, we are going to need to attach this piece to this piece. And you can do that with a variety of different things. Dowels, biscuits, glue, screws, and nails. 
and you can even use scrap pieces of plywood that can be attached to one side or both sides of the stringer to attach this piece to this piece. And I do have other examples of that in other videos. And in our example here, we are using nails to attach the smaller piece to the larger piece. And even finished nails might work better here or pre-drilling your holes to drive the nails into to prevent splitting such a small piece of lumber. And that will become obvious to anyone who uses larger nails to attach the treads and risers to the stringers. And the same might hold true for screws. Because once we start driving the nails into the stair stringer, especially right here at the tip, we could end up splitting this small piece of lumber. And I've seen this done plenty of times when trying to attach two pieces of lumber together like this on lots of different projects I've worked on over the years. So I think the moral to this story is simple. If prices of lumber continue to increase or larger pieces of lumber become less available, then we might need to start using options like this one. Here is another tip for those of you who are going to be building stairs for a wood deck. And you're going to be running the lumber in this direction so that the front part of it will be used as the last step on the set of stairs. And that would be to avoid using center cut lumber. You can see here where the center of the tree is in almost every one of these pieces of lumber. And for those of you who don't know much about lumber, the center of the tree is probably the worst part you can have in a piece of lumber because it will cause it to bow, twist, or cup. And what we're dealing with here is the lumber cupping. And you're not going to have that with composite lumber. It's probably not going to happen. And if for whatever reason you can't find lumber without any center cuts in it, then you should consider at the very least using more than one screw or nail like they did here. For example, on 2x6 decking material like this, I like to use two nails or two screws spaced about 3 quarters of an inch away from the edge. And that can, at the very least, reduce the chances of it cupping or eliminate it happening entirely. Here is another video that I am going to use to try and explain how a framing square works when laying out a set of stair stringers. And this is probably about the fifth explanation I have provided in my video. So let's go ahead and get started by providing you with an example of a stairway that has already been built. As the first part of the project I want you to visualize, it's going to be a lot better if you can imagine what the stairway is going to look like in your mind or use some type of computer-aided software to show you what it's going to look like. So let's go ahead and remove the stairway so that we can take a look at the pattern or template I have created by simply taking the measurement of each step, which is 10 inches, and creating shaped rectangles to actually provide us with an example of what the stairway is going to look like. And all this can be done on the ground. You don't need to stand it up unless you really can't wrap your mind around it. Then you'll need to assemble everything together to do that. And I'm not suggesting you need to do this. However, if you need to, then do it. So each one of these pieces are 10 inches wide, the width of each one of the stair steps, and each one is going to be progressively larger by the height of the riser, which in our example is going to be seven and a half inches. So not too difficult. Now we can imagine what the stairway is going to look like. And if you do build something like this, you can always grab a couple of scrap boards and screw all of these pieces together so that you can create something like this. Next up, let's go ahead and place this on a couple of boards to provide us with another way to lay out our stair stringer. So I can go ahead and grab a pencil and trace each one of the steps out, all the risers, the treads, all the way through. Or I can forget about that and grab my framing square. And again, the purpose of this video is not meant to provide you with 
all of the information you need to build a set of stairs. It's meant to provide you with another example of how you can use a framing square. A lot of people can't wrap their mind around why they're going to grab a framing square and lay all of these marks out on a piece of lumber. It just does not register in their mind. How do I know this? Because I at one time couldn't wrap my mind around it either. So don't feel bad if you can't do it. And again, I do have books at our website. I have hundreds of videos on building stairs you can check out for free if you don't want to get the books. Here's another one of those problems you might not be aware of. And I've seen plenty of experienced masons, project managers, and landscapers make it. And I don't think they even have a clue that there's a building code that says you can not use rounded bullnosing that has a radius larger than 9 sixteenths of an inch. So you can do this. You can have the front of the steps square and even use the section of the brick to protrude to create a nosing. But what they're not going to want to see will be a curve like this. Now you're probably wondering why do they make these types of bricks? Why do they make bricks with bull nosing or curves like this? And that's because they're used on other parts of your project, like the top of a retaining wall. And I know what your next question is going to be, then why do you see so much of this? And my answer to that question is, again, probably most people don't know about it. I sincerely believe that most masons believe that the curved radius on a brick is meant to be used for a stair nosing, when in reality, it's probably not going to meet your local building codes. So here we have a two and a quarter inch wide brick with a radius from the center of the brick of an inch and an eighth. And this is a section right here that can't be larger than nine sixteenths of an inch. It can be nine sixteenths of an inch. And actually, one of the building codes suggests that it can be between nine sixteenths of an inch and a sixteenth of an inch suggesting that it does need to be rounded a little bit and that a square might not be approved by your local building department either. However, I think that's pushing it a little bit. And if you're going to have a bevel, it can't be more than a half inch. And if you are going to have a nosing protrude past the face of the riser, then it needs to be between three quarters of an inch and an inch and a quarter. So it cannot be larger than an inch and a quarter or shorter than three quarters of an inch. So be aware of that one also. In this video, I will provide you with the minimum width of a stairway. These are two measurements basically. And the first one will be in between the hand railing and below. And the second will be the measurements above the hand railing but below the minimum headroom height required by these same building codes. That's usually going to be 6 feet 8 inches if I'm right on that one. However, we will need to take a look at a few more things. And one of them will be whether or not we have one handrail or two handrails. One on one side, one on the other side. And even though I have these handrails drawn here, you might be using different types of handrails or guardrails that these measurements would apply to. So let's go ahead and get started with the first building code from the 2024 International Residential Code Book. And then, of course, I have the building code reference number R318.7.1. And it's basically asking for 36 inches in between the top of the handrail and the bottom of the headroom height. Next up, we're looking at 31 and a half inches in between the top of the handrail and the top of the steps or treads. And that's going to be if you have a handrail on one side. If you have a handrail on two sides, it's going to be 27 inches in between the hand railing. And again, these are minimum measurements. They can be larger, just can't be smaller in these areas. And if you're building spiral stairs, you're looking at 26 inches for the minimum measurements. And if we go to another book, the International Building Code book, you can see here where we have a minimum width of 44 inches with exceptions. And one of those exceptions would be for 50 or less occupants in a building, 
36 inches. Again, this is the minimum width from the residential code book that most of you will be working with if you're building a house or remodeling one. And then there are two more exceptions to this. One will be the spiral stairs and the next will be if you're going to be using a stair lift. And keep in mind that even though I'm providing you with these building codes and the reference numbers you can check on, your local building department, the one located in your city, county, state, or country might have different building code requirements. So make sure that you check with them to verify these building codes so that you can use them on your project in your area. Here is another question from one of our viewers. They wanted to know if a handrail could also be a guardrail. And as far as residential construction goes, the building of homes that we live in, then there's a very good chance you could build something like this. And it's all going to hinge off of whether or not the height of the handrail, which is usually going to be between 34 and 38 inches, can fit into the minimum height for a guardrail. And these measurements can be anywhere from 34 to 42 inches, with 36 or 42 inches being used as the most common measurements. So you could see where a situation like this would work if the handrailing building codes allow for a grippable handrail between 34 and 38 inches, and the minimum height for the guardrail would be 36 inches. However, we would have a different situation here where the guardrail looks like the minimum measurement is 42 inches. And the grippable handrails look like they fall between the 34 and the 38 inch measurement. And the measurements I'm referring to will come off of the front corner of the step. This will be a vertical measurement. And I do have plenty of videos on handrails and guard railing building codes at our website. So make sure that you check those out as well. And let's go ahead and wrap this video up with the only people who can actually answer this question. And that would be your local building department if you have one. If you don't have one, then you can probably build whatever you want to, even though I wouldn't advise it. Here is a problem that I ran into years ago when doing a mitered corner for a set of stairs like this. And I had a difficult time trying to figure out what it was, but hopefully I can make some sense out of it to you. So what we have here is a stringer at a 45 degree angle. These are at a 90 degree angle. However, the mitered joints don't line up. And how I would usually figure a mitered corner would be to take two boards and cut them at a 45 degree angle and see if they lined up. If they didn't, then I would make the necessary adjustments. However, that doesn't mean your stairs are always going to look nice at the mitered joint. And this is exactly what's going to happen here. And I'll share the reason for that at the end of the video. So you can see where the center of the stringer, which is a 45 degree angle, isn't working for this step. And let's go ahead and move it back a little bit to give you an idea of what we're dealing with. And that would be two boards with two different angles. However, the mitered line is connecting the front to the back. And if I cut a 45 degree angle on this, I would have a section of the miter would be a little longer or shorter at one of these ends. So let's go ahead and line up the front of the joint with the center line and see what it's going to look like here. And you can see here where it is not at a 45 degree angle. We're off a little bit here. Let me move my pointer out of the way. You can see where it just doesn't line up there which means the next boards aren't going to line up either. We're not going to have a straight line from the front to the back. And the reason for that, believe it or not, is because these boards are shorter in width by an eighth of an inch than these boards. So if you run into a situation like this where your miter joints aren't lining up, but you have all of your stringers in the correct spot, and you're using the stuff the old carpenters used called lumber, and not manufacture decking materials. Then make sure that you check the width of the lumber to make sure that isn't going to be your first problem. And thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, let us know by hitting the thumbs up button or letting us know in the comment area.